Oh my gosh, welcome everybody. You're coming to hear this video recording right now where we're introducing Monica's presentation today. It's going to be so cool. Monica Zhang specializes in the intersection between behavioral science and service design. She enjoys blending insights from organizational cognitive and social psychology with human-centered design tools to change behavior both within teams and with customers. She has enabled product and service teams to unpack how context shapes decisions Forms hypo form hypotheses and build testable designs to help end users flourish. My gosh, Monica, you are promising a lot today. Um, <laughs> before Rational Labs, Monica worked as a service designer at the Canadian at a Canadian bank. For those of you that live in the Great White North, this means a lot to you because they have like five banks. So CIBC and is behavioral econ uh, economics consultant for a boutique firm BE Works across a variety of sectors. She's helped reduce bias in hiring, increase savings, and manage debt, improve energy conversation. I was going to say energy conversation. No, energy conservation and increase school attendance, among other real world problems. I will also tell you this Monica is one of the most delightful, kind, funny, intelligent, witty, brilliant human beings I have ever met. And I'm not just saying that. Every time we have a retreat, she's one of my favorite people to sit with. Um, because there is all kinds of stuff going on between her ears that you want to get a taste of. So with that, Monica, take over. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. I feel, I always feel so energized after your introductions. I really wish you could just like be there, be in my head, like every day when I wake up to just hype me up for the day. Um, I'm there that for was you. so lovely. <laughs> we should, re we did record it. So if you need to just kind of edit it and make it your wake up thing. Go for it's it. It's true. It's true. All right. Can you see my screen okay? No. Oh. Let me try again. Yeah, it takes we just tested this. So let's see if it works now. I know, right? And then all of a sudden you go live and whew. No, it's continuing it? to be weird, Monica. It's blacking it out. That is so bizarre. Okay, let me try. Okay. Which is weird because we did just test it. Oh, there you go. Well, that's better. But still, is that not showing up? I don't know. It has black splotches kind of on the sides, on the edges. Hmm. Go to see now? that takes care of business. I wonder if that's like an overlay of Zoom controls or something. Yeah, that's what it is. You're right. That's was that Sam? Mm. Corey. Is it working? Oh, no, the a the moment there. Overlaying. She has a double screen set up that she was working with. So this is I, what. Yeah, I don't have a double screen set up anymore and it's still not working, huh? Okay, let me see. May have to. Well, technical I mean, difficulties. Yeah. And as okay. we're talking in the chat, why don't you do this? Write down where you come are coming to us from today so we can get a sense of where our worldwide audience is at. And Monica, if the next share doesn't work, I'll just have to be your clicker. Um, so good. definitely take another pass and then Shay, you'll have to be the chat master, which is totally fine. But, um, you know, we do have a plan B. So Facilitator. I'm a master of none. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's see if, if this doesn't work. Yeah. Then Ryan, you can be my quick master and everyone will just have to deal with me saying, yeah. uh, fortunately, <laughs> they're, a very, they're a mature bunch. <laughs> Okay, cool. Let's let's give this another shot. Okay. Fingers crossed. By the way, this is not a ploy to make you emotional and frustrated. Um, <laughs> right at the beginning, like, oh my gosh, yeah, it's still doing the overlay, Monica. So why don't I just share? Oh, so bizarre. Okay. Well, Which is things can share, weird, but yeah, okay. I wonder if I logged out of Zoom and came back if it would work. Uh, at this point. Um, Cool. Get... And Ryan, could you also make sure to share the audio, the computer audio? Oh, I did just screw that up. Hold on. <laughs> um, so I have to go share advanced and I need to share no basic. It is the, oh, it's on the bottom, the Text click. Got it. Got it. Yep. Okay, cool. Share. Here we go. Okay. All right. Take two. All right. So take it away, Monica. Cool. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. Perfect. Um, welcome everyone. 
So glad to be with you all here today and good morning. Uh, today we're going to be talking about emotion by design. As we all know in this room, emotions drive a lot of our decision making. And, you know, sometimes it can be good, other times maybe not so optimal. And so today we're going to kind of start to dissect this word emotion. It is a big word. We're not going to be able to talk about all of it today. And hopefully this is just a means to whet your appetite, make you excited about emotions and um, learn a little bit about how to apply emotions to either your personal life or the way you design products and environments. Okay, next, Ryan, let's queue up the video. Um, and maybe we'll just let you, yeah, play. At this exact spot? Yes. Okay. Oh, we just fell down. We should cry. Sadness, no! Ah, we can't cry in front of other kids! Stop her! Stop it, Sadness! Oh, I can't help it, Joy. I'm entering a sadness spiral. Disgusting! He's getting tears on Joy, me! Joy, calm her down! Uh, okay, uh, how about we stop being sad and, um... <laughs> hey, look at this! I'm doing the happy dance. I'm not wearing any pants. Something, something, France. I'm doing the happy dance. Hey! Your desperation makes me sad. Okay, forget that. Um, how about we turn that frown upside down, huh? All right, good hustle, everyone. Now let's get some ice cream. Ice cream! Ice cream! Hello, anger. Get off of me. <laughs> uh, Ryan, if you go, go to the next ice cream. <laughs> Ryan, honestly, I feel like uh, you remind me so much of Joy. The character of Joy. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Send ice cream my way. <laughs> yeah, that is the big takeaway of today's talk is that ice cream will fix everything. <laughs> it is the one thing that will address all emotions. Um, I'm kidding. But in case uh, those of you out here haven't seen this film, it is a 2015 Pixar film it's called Inside Out. Very cute. I see some uh, comments in the chat. People love it. I also loved it. Um, but spoiler alert, that's not exactly how emotions work, right? Um, and today, as much as I'd like to imagine, that's how it kind of works with these five characters in my head. Uh, we're going to kind of figure out what actually works beyond the surface uh, to, to uh, inform emotionally driven decisions. So just to unpack this a little bit, right? In this film, you're kind of seeing these characters talking to each other, but in, in real life, when we think about us feeling an emotion, there's a lot that's happening. There is an external or internal stimuli. So in this case, she fell down. It's like an objective thing that, that happens in the world. And then there's the other side of it, which is our subjective experience. How do we process and understand what just happened, right? It's the appraisal of that experience itself. Then there are also physiological changes, maybe increased heart rate, sweating, you know, you feel tears welling in your eyes, different goals might be activated, we may want to run away from the situation, cover ourselves, these goals become more salient to us as we experience these feelings. It also dictates what we pay attention to, maybe we're looking around and all we see are the people that are kind of laughing at us, right? The funny thing about emotions is that we tend to, we're more likely to remember memories that are congruent with what we're feeling right now. So if we're feeling happy, then we're remembering happy memories. But in this case, we're feeling embarrassment, then all we can think about are the things that embarrassing things that happened to us in the past. All of these things kind of come together to form what we call a behavioral response, right? This is how we decide to action the thing that we're feeling, how we decide to make the decision based off that. So the point here um, and why it matters to kind of break it apart in a more explicit way is like with anything, like with behavioral science, the more we can start to break things apart, understand the process, be able to label specific parts of that process, the more we have a lever and a tool to be able to design for it and design with it. So that's kind of the point of today. Uh, we're going to get into some examples, looking at emotions um, in their parts and uncover some of these specific strategies that you can use, whether it's in your product or your personal life. And today's talk is going to take three parts. Uh, three parts always works out to be the best number. Uh, part one is 
pathways of influence, we're gonna try and understand how emotions influence decisions. What are these pathways that it can take? The second part is diving into specific emotions and how they influence decision-making. And then finally, um, an emotional toolkit. This is kind of our approach and how we might think about using emotions, applying emotions and designing for them in the work that we do. Okay, so to start, uh, let's go through and talk about the three pathways that influence decisions. And we're going to be talking about cued, anticipated, and spillover emotions. The third one is my favorite, but we'll get to the first two first. Um, next slide, Ryan. So if you think back to uh, tax season this year and think about how you felt during tax season, I don't know about the rest of you, but I certainly felt avoidant, anxious. I felt, you know, a little frustrated. Now imagine you're kind of feeling all of those things about this decision, and then you arrive onto this page and you're faced with all of these different options or plans that you can choose from. How confident would you feel in this moment making this decision? For me, likely not very confident, right? It may actually exacerbate the anxiety and the frustration that I already feel. And this is what we call a cued emotion. So this is a highly influential feelings that arise from the decision at hand, arise from the decision of having to choose a tax solution, for example. So it's the decision context or the um, decision that you have to make that cues the anxiety in this case, and then that leads to and informs the decision and the behavior um, that you are going to uh, enact after feeling the, and seeing the product and interacting with it in this way. So that's the first pathway. Um, I'll illustrate the second pathway with this example. Uh, raise your hand, in this case, if you regularly purchase uh, lottery tickets. I can't really see Ryan, so could you let me know? <laughs> uh, if you go to the next slide, Ryan, also. Okay. Oh, I'm looking to see myself because I spotlighted you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Um, just assume, let's assume four people raise their hand and none of okay, them. Okay, so yeah, not many, not many, and that's probably because none of you uh live in the Netherlands. Maybe I don't know, maybe some of you do. But what if I told you that you're automatically entered into a lottery every month along with all of your neighbors, the people that you know around you? But the catch is that you'll only be able to claim the prize should you win if you bought a ticket that month. Now, this is exactly what they do in the Netherlands in the next slide. Um, they have something called a postcode lottery. And the idea is that this lottery is drawn by postcode. So if you happen to have bought a ticket, then you win the prize. If you did it, well, then you kind of end up like this guy. If you click next, Ryan. <laughs> so what this guy here, is experiencing is something that many of us probably have felt before. Uh, this is what we call anticipated regret, if you click again. Uh, and anticipated regret, so regret as we know, is a kind of backward looking feeling that we feel after something has happened that we regret. However, anticipated regret is something that is forward looking. It's a forward looking emotion, and it makes us feel like we're responsible for a bad outcome. It makes us kind of kick ourselves over this anticipated mistake. And it is incredibly powerful in driving our decisions and the way that we uh, navigate the world. And on the next slide, this kind of sums it up. This is what we call anticipated emotion. Prediction, how we think we're gonna feel in the future can actually feel, can actually influence our feeling and decisions in the now. So for example, anticipating a painful shock may lead to fear or anticipating getting on a roller coaster can also lead to the same emotion. Uh, and it's interesting, I find this one really interesting because we're really not that great at forecasting how intensely we might feel about something in the future. So, you know, I, I am so prone to that every single time I go to any kind of mall and I go shopping, I always feel like that pair of shoes is going to make me so happy in the future and never actually ends up making you as happy for as long as you think. So that's the anticipated emotion. And the next one, and this is one of my favorites, is um, 
oh, well, I won't reveal it yet. So before I get to this example, I want you to kind of think about someone you know that you're attracted to. Now, if I ask you why you're attracted to them, you can probably tell me a lot of things, right? Maybe it's their personality, their smile, their style, and all in all, you probably are likely to attribute that attraction that you feel to something about them. But what if I told you that maybe it has something to do with the bridge? Well, in this case, it probably didn't, but let's go to the next slide here. Um, in the study, what the researchers did was they had a, a woman, a confederate, so this is someone who is a part of the study, but other people don't know that they're a part of the study. Um, they have her stand in the middle of a suspension bridge. And then as men pass her on their way across, she asked them if they would like to fill out a questionnaire. And then after they're done filling out the questionnaire, she then asked them, uh, if you would like to discuss this further, you can give me a call and give, give them uh, her phone number. What the researchers found was that actually in the study, if you go to next, Ryan, there are two conditions. One, where the men were walking across a suspension bridge. So this is kind of a scary thing. It kind of shakes from side to side. And then the other one, this really wide and stable wooden bridge. What the researchers found here on the slide is that far more men ended up calling this research assistant um, at the end of the study, 50% um, called when they walked across the suspension bridge versus only 12.5% called when it was the wooden bridge. So the idea here is something that we call misattribution of arousal. So it's one that incorrectly interprets the emotions they feel to the wrong source. So we often think that we know why we feel strongly about something, but we don't. And that's the, the most surprising thing about the study is that people were completely unaware of how this incidental feeling of suspense, excitement, fear led to their increased feelings of attraction for this person they encountered along the way. So the takeaway here is we're just really good at rationalizing why we feel the way we feel without thinking about the content. And this is what we call on the next slide, spillover emotion. This is feelings at the time of decision that are actually completely unrelated to the decision itself. So another good example of this is that there's some finding around how stock market returns actually declines when a country's soccer team is eliminated, eliminated from the World Cup. Completely unrelated decisions, and yet such a substantial impact on uh, decisions that people make. Another good example of this that I experienced recently and has worked on me is uh, I went to Disney World for the first time. And one thing that I noticed is that they put all of their uh, shops at the exit of a ride. So when you go on a roller coaster, you go on a throw ride right after, that's when they get you. That's when they get you to buy all of the themed things from their store. And let me tell you, it works. I mean, at least on me, it works. Okay, so what does this all mean then? On the next slide, I'll try and summarize. So I think as designers, as people thinking about how emotions influence your products, there are specific questions you can begin to ask to understand what is the source of the emotion that people are feeling. Understanding source allows us to design for it. So when it comes to cute emotion, we're asking questions like what emotions might the decision at hand or the decision context thing that people are interacting with what might it trigger? The second one is anticipated emotion. So in this case, we're asking how might users think they'll feel when they make one decision or another? So if you have options either, or I guess the third option here is how many people think they feel if they completely avoided the decision overall. This is worth thinking about. And then finally, for my favorite spill spillover emotion, um, we're thinking about Things like what emotions are users bringing with them? You know, did they just donate to charity before they arrived at our product? Or it could be 
this could be um, an earlier emotion at an earlier interaction with your product that they're bringing now to the decision at hand. So all of these things are super important to think about. And if we ask the right questions, we can better decide for the emotions that people are feeling in the moment of decision making. All right. So now that we understand the pathways a little bit, let's dive into the specific emotions that people do feel um, when they are uh, making decisions. So how do specific emotions influence decision making? On the next slide, I have this kind of, I know, fun diagram to try and illustrate it. So a really quick and dirty way to think about emotions is along the spectrum of yes or no emotion. So if you click, Ryan, sorry, I have so many animations in this slide. Um, well, on the yes side, these are the emotions that we want, right? We want to do things that will bring us into the state or keep us in the state. So these are things like happiness, gratitude, pride, surprise. And then on the other side, we have no decision. These are things that we don't want. We want to do things that will avoid or stop us from feeling the state. So sadness, fear, disgust, anxiety. I'll pause on anger because that one's a little bit more interesting and it helps us to introduce the next part of this. So obviously this is like a very simple way of looking at emotions. Um, and it simplicity sometimes is good because it does allow us to uh, do more uh, and apply heuristic to design for them. However, the story is a little bit more complicated. And today, if you go to the next slide, I'll just, yes, this is perfect, Ryan. Um, introduce one additional dimension. I won't overwhelm you. If you are interested, you can read more about this. The research is fascinating here. But one additional dimension that I'll introduce is this idea of certainty. So this is an appraisal. This is how we understand what's happening. There are some emotions like happiness, that gives us a lot of certainty. We really feel like we understand what's happening around us and that we have a control to predict what will happen in the future. And then there are other emotions that are very low certainty where we don't know what's gonna happen. Um, and if you go to the next slide, I kind of map this out for you using just four um, basic emotions that we may feel, anger, happiness, sadness, and surprise. So why does this complicate things? Well, what when you look at this, um, what ends up happening is that along both of these dimensions, there are emotions that share the same, what we call valence, so the yes to no spectrum, like anger and sadness that can have completely opposing effects on the way that people make decisions. Whereas there are emotions that are opposite potentially of that spectrum, no and yes, like anger and happiness uh, that can exert the same influence, similar influences. So let's talk about then anger and happiness. Um, so these are both high certainty emotions. They actually, one thing that they do when it's high certainty, not surprisingly, what it does is it reduces the, what we call the depth of processing. So what this means is that you are much more likely when you're feeling these high certainty emotions to use heuristics or stereotypes. If you think about like system one big processing, right? You're much more likely to use those things to navigate the environment around you, to make decisions around you. And um, maybe I'll illustrate this with an example on the next slide. So let's take a look at a behavior like sharing, sharing, misinformation on social media. Now, how do we, if we wanted to get people to be a little bit more discerning about what it is they're sharing on the internet, what do we do? So first step is really to understand how emotions can influence their decision to share in this case, right? And if you click, so specifically both happiness and anger, high certainty emotions make us feel, make us more likely to gauge the content that we're looking at by its superficial characteristics. Remember, lower depth of processing, use of heuristics. So in this case, we're looking at things like the length of the message to gauge its credibility. We're looking at things like how likable is the source? How, you know, how famous is the source? 
we're looking at the appeal of the header, we're looking at the visuals, we're looking at everything kind of at the surface level to determine if this content is worth sharing. Anger in this case also makes us feel like we know what's going on and can lead us to judge more stereotypically. It could fuel the anger and make us more likely to use these heuristics to make a judgment. So then what do we do about it? Now, step one is recognizing the emotions that are involved. And then after that, we also have to understand why these emotions increase heuristic processing. So in this case, it's because it is a praise that's high certainty. So with that now, we have levers that we can play with, right? Um, in fact, there is this one intervention that I, I just love uh, that basically what they do, if you click on, is they reduce the certainty appraisal in order to reduce the influence these emotions have on people's sharing behavior. Um, if you click again, I'll give you a visual of what this looked like. This is a study that was published in Nature in 2021. And what the researchers did was something really clever. So they sent random people um, on Twitter these different unsolicited messages that just asked them, hey, how accurate is this headline? Can you take a little survey and let me know how you judge this headline? Now, it didn't matter if people actually took the survey. What it mattered was that they saw this, right? They saw this, they may have chosen to engage with it, they might not have. What this did was kind of find accuracy in their minds. So what people all of a sudden, um, after engaging or not engaging, but just looking at this message, um, what the researchers did was they looked at their behavior, their sharing behavior after this point. And what they found was that, thank you, Ryan, that users who were sent and saw the messages were more discerning in sharing decisions within 24 hours of re receiving this uh, relative to similar others. Um, they also shared news sources that were of higher quality. All in all, what was happening here is that the researchers we're effectively reducing the level of certainty we felt about our, our environment. And this allowed people to think more thoroughly and more deeply about the headlines they were reading. So that's just one example. And then I'll give you one more just to illustrate this a little bit further. And I think sadness is one of the most interesting emotions. Uh, we watched uh, the, the film clip Inside Out earlier on. I actually dressed the sadness uh, one year for Halloween. I do think that it's a super interesting, complicated emotion. Um, and it's interesting because on the one hand, it actually, it reduces the perceived certainty, right? It's low on the spectrum, uh, which means that it can improve deeper processing. However, it's also on the no side of the spectrum. What that tells us is that the more processing we do, the more likely we are to ruminate. And what could that lead to? Things like delaying the decision, increasing procrastination, or just full on avoidance. We've over processed what it is that we have to do. Um, one other really good example of sadness is if we look at sadness in the context of present bias or temporal discounting. This is something that you're probably already familiar with the fact that we overvalue the now at the expense of the future. Now, when participants were feeling sad in the moment of making this decision, and they were given the option to take a little bit of money today or a lot more money in three months, what did they do? On the next slide, do a little reveal here. So not surprisingly, people are present biased, as we know, but people who are experiencing sadness were willing to forego 13 to 34% of the available money relative to people that were feeling a neutral state just to get the money to debt, to get it immediately. So what this tells us is that sadness actually exacerbates the effect of present bias in this case. It makes people a lot more impatient with what they're doing. So when we're sad, we're more likely then to want immediate rewards, immediate satisfaction. And this could influence a lot of decisions um, in many different directions, but specifically if you're thinking about healthcare decisions or financial decisions that have these longer term benefits um, 
at the expense of immediate rewards, we're going to have to think about how do we design a process, a product that allows people to still get that immediate reward uh, when we're dealing with these long-term benefits. Okay, so I'm not going to, there's so much to say here and I'm not gonna go through everything in detail because I oh, do wanna give this, you- This, this scream screenshot though, I feel like- this is, I, this is, Yes, yeah. this is a screenshot. This is exactly, it's a screen grab uh, slide that I've created so that you can have this on hand as you're thinking about designing for these uh, four different emotions. Uh, this is gathered from a paper that Jennifer Lerner and colleagues wrote, a really nice summary paper uh, called Emotion Decision-Making. So it's, it's a fun read if you're ever interested. But for now, feel free to grab. This is a high-level summary that hopefully will help you as you're thinking about designing for specific emotions. But with our time today, I do want to talk a little bit more about how do you make this into a process, right? If you were to apply this uh, in the way that we would, what is your toolkit? What can you use? And I'll give you some fun examples at the end as well of uh, tactics that you can use. So Ryan, if you can go to the next slide, we're gonna get into part three, and then we're gonna start part three with the next slide, 3B framework. So as hopefully at this point is, quite familiar to you. We have our 3B framework for identifying a hyper-specific, uncomfortable key behavior that we are trying to uh, accomplish or our users, we're trying to get our users to accomplish. Then we're looking at how do we reduce the barriers that stand in the way of that key behavior and how do we amplify the psychological benefits of achieving that key behavior. So when it comes to emotions on the next slide, we are simply adding an emotional layer in a more intentional way to the behavioral diagnosis, right? So at the start, we talked about the current state emotions, the different pathways, cute emotion, anticipated, and spillover. And the questions that we may ask of our users when we're thinking about what emotions are at play right now. Then what we do is we compare those emotions with the key behavior. And we are trying to understand, is there alignment? Are these emotions helping or hindering the key behavior? What emotions, or perhaps lack thereof, would actually encourage better decision-making in this case? So the, the idea here is that once we understand if there's a mismatch, then we can begin to think about how do we reduce the emotional barriers that stand in the way that are not conducive to the intended key behavior? And then how do we amplify the emotional benefits, things that are really helpful um, for achieving that key behavior we have in mind. Okay, so let me give you some specific examples. This is definitely not uh, completely comprehensive. Um, once again, there are so many different ways to approach this, but these are just some of my favorites uh, that I'll share with you today. So when it comes to reducing emotional barriers, and there's a couple of different ways of dealing with this. So in this case, we're dealing with a situation where Emotions are getting in the way of optimal decision-making. So we can do two things. One, we can either reduce the magnitude of the emotion felt, or we can try and separate emotion from the decision-making process. So we'll talk a little bit about both of them. The first example I'll give you is delaying the decision. So on the next slide, I have a, um, an application here. So. One thing that we do know about emotions, uh, maybe perhaps somewhat counterintuitively, is that emotions are quite short-lived. They don't last very long. In the video we saw kind of they were feeling sad and then the ice cream immediately changed how they were feeling uh, in that moment. Um, and sometimes what we need is a little bit of friction or delay in the process in order to just reduce, let it kind of pan out, right? reduce the emotional response that people uh, feel. So in this case, our work with TikTok, many of you probably have seen this before. Uh, what we did here was simply add a little bit of friction um, to give people that time to slow down and think about the decision that they're making at hand. So adding this caution banner and pop-up in this case, before people were sharing flagged content on TikTok, actually reduced the sharing behavior by 24%. And what we're doing is that if this content, as we said before, 
probably cued some level of really high certainty behavior that made people feel comfortable sharing it. And here we're saying, hey, let's slow down. And then by slowing down, we can actually get people to rethink or just write out that emotion and make the decision uh, more rationally. On the next slide, we'll get into the second strategy, which is reappraisal. Now, as I said, appraising our understanding of what's happening uh, is incredibly important to how we then feel and respond to that feeling. And so when it comes to reappraisal, what we're really trying to do is help users reappraise the source of the emotional response and it can reduce its impact, right? So one example of this, a concrete example of this may be if someone is using urgent care very overactively because they're experiencing these symptoms in the moment that are really alarming to them and perhaps uh, arousing a lot of fear. Uh, one way to kind of tweak the situation, get people to think about it in a different way, is to ask them to view the situation from another perspective. So one example is, can you look at the symptom, think about the symptoms that you're experiencing from the per perspective of your physician? How would they respond to it? By cueing that, it can actually eliminate some of the fear that we feel and allow us to then decide, is it actually worthwhile to go to urgent care right now? Or another part of this is thinking about things like job seeking. Um, when someone is job seeking post layoff, you can either see it as a failure, a personal failure, and feel a tremendous amount of sadness, um, and potentially, as I said before, leading to that avoidance behavior. Or if the job search site does a really good job of helping you reappraise this as an opportunity to pursue one's dreams, then it could potentially dampen some of the effects of uh, sadness on your decision and on, on your behavior on that platform. Okay, the third- Am I, am I playing example. that video, Monica, or no? No, it's just the picture, it's a screen. Oh, okay, cool, cool, <laughs> got it, got it. <laughs> the third example is a nice illustration of, well, how do we just separate emotions from the decision that people are making? And this, as we all know, changing the environment can really help with that. So making the emotional choice just simply less accessible could be one way of reducing its influence on behavior. So in this case, in order to reduce unhealthy snacking, um, when you position the snack further away from a uh, the coffee the coffee table at the cap at a cafeteria, people are much uh, less likely to actually snack unhealthily. So very simple simple change to the environment can change how we make decisions. Okay, let's get to, um, I don't want to, you know, be biased here, but the fun bit, <laughs> the yes emotion. So on the amplifying emotion side, um, I'll go through a couple of examples of uh, two strategies. The first one is to boost the yes emotions that people are thinking, that people are feeling. And one example of that on the next slide, uh, I actually love this example. I get so much joy from using Asana just simply because of this, but they do such a good job of uh, including small, variable, positive reinforcement that does such a good job at boosting happiness. So they have this like flying unicorn that flies across the screen every single time you complete the task. Actually, I don't think it's every time, which makes it even more powerful because as we know, we become hedonically adapted to something, right? We're on a hedonic treadmill, meaning that things that are good now, in five minutes, we just get used to it. We become desensitized and they're no longer bringing us the same amount of happiness. And they do such a good job of just adding that element of surprise. Sometimes you get this unicorn, sometimes you don't. Um, so this is, yeah, I love this example. If you want more examples like this, if you want to think about motivation, uh, just a quick shout out to last month's uh, membership talk Lisa did. I don't know, Ryan, if you can share the, the link, but she does a lot more there to talk a little bit about all of these different ways of boosting positive emotions and increasing motivation to do a behavior. The next example is Calm. I know Kristen just did a tear down here, but one thing that I love about Calm is the music. This is so unique to the brand and what they do. And um, 
I don't know if you know this, but in advertising, they say, if you can't make your case to an audience with that, sing it to them. Now I'm not about to dive into song and dance right now, but this just illustrates that this well-known fact that music has such a critical effect on emotion. It does such a good job of inducing certain emotions in us and Calm knows that and Calm leverages it. So every single time you enter the app for the people that haven't used this before, you just are met with the most soothing visuals and music that play in the background. Um, and it, it just immediately resets your mental state. One note here for those of you that are thinking about how specifically to, to design for this is that for products that have high personal consequences, so things like if you're selling safety equipment or software packages where there are already a lot of really strong arguments for why you should be getting this product versus another, um, the background music playing emotional music can actually undercut the effectiveness of the thing that you're trying to achieve. So it's everything with behavioral science, context matters, and we need to think about what exactly is the problem we're trying to solve. Okay, finally, uh, be timely. So I love this uh, particular strategy. It applies so broadly across uh, many different areas. And the first example that I'll give you is something that Tinder does uh, on the next slide. So Tinder knows when exactly you're in a hot state. <laughs> they know that hot states can impact your rational decision-making. What they do is imagine you're scrolling through Tinder, you come across someone, but your thumb, because you're so used to your Tinder thumb, just accidentally swipes left on them. Now, in that moment, you're probably feeling a tremendous amount of regret, and you're trying to reverse that decision. And Tinder has a button for it. You can try and reverse that decision. Uh, and this is the moment that they leverage to try and upsell you to Tinder Plus. So specifically, when people use that rewind feature to undo a mistake, uh, this is when Tinder tells you all the benefits of Tinder Plus, including unlimited rewinds. And in this case, because you're in that hot state of feeling a lot of regret over the decision, you're much more prone. Now, I'm not saying do this, but in this case, they do a good job of making sure that they are timing the decision with an emotion you might already be feeling. And that as a strategy, I think can be helpful uh, in applications. And one final example of being timely is uh, I think credit card payments are so interesting. And I used to work for a bank, but it's just so interesting because when you think about credit cards, the moments when people are more likely to, to sign up for credit are the moments when they are cash poor. They don't have money, they want credit. And yet credit card bill statements are timed at those exact moments when you sign up for credit cards, right? So they have not really thought about people's emotions at that time of the month. And in fact, research has shown that when you actually give people some more agency, some options to choose when their billing cycle should be, when they should pay pay off their credit card, uh, they're more likely to choose moments when they're cash rich. And during those moments, they're also much more likely to pay off their debt. So this is just something to think about. Um, are the things that you've designed timely in a way that it aligns with the emotions that people are feeling um, to achieve the key behavior? Okay. So before I do a wrap up, I just want to do a quick thank you to everyone for spending um, this hour with me. Uh, I am, I love this topic. I think it's so fascinating. And if you are like me and want to read on more, um, I can definitely send you some resources after. Uh, before a quick wrap up, I'll just highlight the three things that we talked about today. Uh, on the next slide, the first thing is we talked about how do we understand the pathways and ask the right questions. Here, if you click, there are a lot of animations on this side, Ryan, so you can just kind of flow with me here. Uh, we try to understand what people are feeling, what the current state emotions are, what are the sources of those emotions. We talked about cued, anticipated, and spillover emotions that could influence the decision that people are making. The second part, we talked about understanding the answers. So what, how specific emotions in this case then influence the decisions that people make. And then finally, we talked about what to do about it. So I gave some 
quick examples on how you might be able to add the emotional layer to your diagnosis and think about strategies along the way to reduce emotional barriers and amplify emotional benefits. Uh, there's a lot more to explore here. We talked about basic emotions, but there are complex emotions like curiosity, awe, nostalgia. So I hope that gets you excited. I hope that you can take something concrete away from this talk and uh, look at your product and or experience and or your personal life through a, a new lens. Uh, so yeah, thank you again. Well, Monica, I think everybody has high certainty that there will be high value things here um, <laughs> that they can use, but they're nervous now because they know context matters. So they don't want to get angry if it doesn't work. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but um, <Love> <laughs> all right, I'm going to stop the share. Um, hopefully people have been, I'm not over there, but hopefully people have been dropping questions in the Q&A doc. I'm gonna head over there, but I do just wanna say quickly, um, thank you so much, Monica. It was great fun, lots of interesting stuff. Um, Sharon, your question is number one. So you're gonna, it's Sharon and Eden are on deck. So Sharon, take, take it away. Monica, first, thanks so much for a great presentation. You always bring a lot of depth to your work and to your presentations. Um, my question was this, I was intrigued by that um, variable reward, small but variable mm -hmm. rewards, because I've seen so much research from Irrational Labs has shown us that rewards, that the behavior extinguishes once the reward is removed. Is it a general principle that the counter to that is introducing small but variable rewards? Exactly. So, so the reason why behavior <laughs> extinguishes um, is because, well, the, if the reward is very contingent to the behavior, then obviously when the reward's not there, then the behavior is less, less likely to happen, but also because of the thing called hedonic adaptation, right? People get desensitized, so even if you continuously give the same reward, the behavior might still distinguish at some point because people are just desensitized to the level of, say, happiness that the reward provides them. So by making it variable, so in a lot of these studies, what they find is that when it's a variable interval, when the reward, you know, some reward is going to be there, but you don't know when. So if you think about the thing like uh, lotteries, right, it's a, it's a great example of that. Or um, <laughs> there are other companies that kind of do a pretty good job at this. When you have variable instances, uh, you know, you may get it on a Tuesday, you may get it on a Friday, but you don't know when that kind of leads you to want to continue going. It's quite intuitive as a concept because you are expecting a reward, but there's a level of curiosity. There is a level of anticipation that drives the behavior and increases the chances that the, um, the effects of the reward will continue even when the reward is actually fewer in number relative to something that is like behavior reward, behavior reward. Great. Thanks so much. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Eden in Boston or Boston and Eden. I, are you there? Come off. Yeah. Come on down. Hi there. Um, uh, yeah. Eden, uh, ni uh, nice to meet you all virtually. <laughs> um, but uh, thanks, Monica. It was such a great chat. Um, I also love your glasses right now. I'm having some serious envy. Thank you. Um, uh, but my question was, so I work in very much like a digital healthcare environment and <laughs> I am so interested in the emotion piece, um, but mm -hmm. I have a hard time of like how, I mean, obviously like you can think through um, like the emotions that your members might be dealing and you kind of are like coming up with like your personas or, or trying to understand those. But sometimes when you're texting, it's so hard, like you're in that text environment of like knowing what emotional state they're in. So I don't know if there are any tips or just best practices when it comes to like a digital behavior change environment and applying emotion, like applying some of this research. So in, in terms of the digital, is your question that you don't, it, it's hard to know what emotions people are feeling in the moment or? Yeah, yeah like, yeah. you know, so it's like, can you really target um, when you're, um, you're not even sure when they might open it, you know, or, you know, you just, it's, it's hard to understand. I healthcare itself, though, comes with a lot of uncertainty. So it's yes. kind of, do you, do you lean towards that? 
yeah, I'm kind of just leaning into the healthcare space. So this is this is very top of mind for me right now. Um, I think so when in the most recent project we did, we actually because we didn't understand the emotional context of users, we did um, a lot of qualitative work ahead of actually diving into the diagnosis just to better understand. But when we say qualitative, what we mean is like what we call like a, a behavioral qual. So in this case, we're really specifically diving into like each action and how people feel when they're when, when they're doing those actions. Now it's not the perfect thing because like I said, people are like not very good at knowing they can post, post rationalize a whole lot. Um, but that's one way to get us a little bit closer to be able to better hypothesize what it is. So, you know, what are they feeling before they look at the emails that you're sending them? Like, is that influencing why they're not opening the emails at all? Um, you know, they could be feeling very uh, overwhelmed, right, with the amount of resources that are coming their way and then learning and hypothesizing how to solve for that. Another way, like in the digital world, I think more and more, there are so many opportunities to dive into things like, I don't know how much information you have from users, but diving th into things like sentiment analysis to try and understand how users are feeling in the moment of interaction. There are also ways to um, basically plug into a moment on your app so if you are very curious about, and you're, you're noticing a lot of drop off at one stage of your uh, digital product and you don't know why, um, is there a way to kind of plug in a small survey item at that moment to try and just get a better sense of how people are feeling? We also had this instance with, a, with another project that we did where it was like, there was, we just didn't know what was happening and we couldn't do it, but the recommendation was basically Let's find out how people are feeling at that moment, what they're looking for by inserting, I think, I can't remember the name of the program, but there are, there are software and um, uh, companies out there that allow you to do that, where you can like insert a survey at the right moment to try and understand what's going on. So helpful. So many ideas. I'm going to have to rewatch the recording just to, I wasn't taking the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Right. Thanks, you have to watch it in slow motion, right? To get all the nuance <laughs> and detail. Um, <laughs> well, thank you so much. All right, this is tricky. Shay, um, Shay and Avi, you have kind of a team question. So Shay, could you lead and then Avi, can you follow up? Yes, absolutely. Um, first off, thank you so much for this presentation, Monica. I learned a ton. Um, so my question was, um, oh, sorry. I've been like reading and listening to a lot about just like the very disturbing like rise in uh, depression and anxiety among teens. Mm. Um, and I'm curious just in general if you're aware of any research that uh, speaks to using emotion well within the choice architecture in populations with anxiety or depression. Um, and then yeah, Avi, did you want to follow up um, with your follow up? Yeah, I was just thinking about that. Um, so I have the same question as Shay, and then I was thinking is even if it's just kind of any person with a baseline um, emotion, emotional state, or let's say risk or um, uncertainty tolerance that's that's different. Um, and so that'd be a level of arousal mm -hmm. or level of valence on the induced emotion that you're trying to go for is, is not quite the same. It, does that change the response? Yeah, for sure. I mean, when we're getting into the category of individual differences, everything that we're looking at here are kind of like generalized population findings. So individual differences are definitely at play. And I think the, the question that you're both asking is, is this differentiation between mood and emotion. So mood tend to be things that are more longer lasting, pervasive, things like depression, um, even like sadness can be a mood as well, right? That lasts for, for a long period of time. Time. That's not my area of expertise. Uh, that would be more more clinical psychology. But I will say that I think if product designers, experience designers, people that work to create to create the context for everybody out there in the world are more intentional about what emotions they are designing for, then at the very least, we will be able to reduce the risk of exacerbating these negative emotions and hopefully. Um, reducing some of the things that Shay you mentioned about choice architecture, right? This is I didn't go too much into into detail around choice architecture because so much of it is covered in the in the course and the work that we generally do. But in those moods when people are, you know, 
whether it's depressed, feeling lonely, like what are things that we can do at the decision level to at the very least help push towards a better, longer term um, decision for them? That that would be incredibly helpful. But it's I've been I've been watching the same and listening to the same shows and thinking about this a lot. I have no easy fixes, but I can just say hopefully, you know, everyone's a little bit more intentional about the the role that emotion and moods play in our daily lives um, now more than ever, I think. Thank you so much, Monica. Really helpful response. Yeah, so that's wild that we got two questions from Durham. So to our North Carolina friends, thank you for wrapping us up today. Um, Monica, <laughs> spectacular, joyful, all yes emotions with you today. Um, <laughs> so thank you so much for your time, your expertise, your wisdom, and um, your desire to engage with everybody. Remember, Monica is available at Monica at Irrational Labs if you have any follow-up questions. We will be back here next week. It is the open event, so those are usually crazy packed. Um, but we hope to see all of you, including our regulars, um, next week to talk about ethnographic research. I think you're going to find Faith's presentation quite intriguing. Um, so with that, yeah, and please, uh, with that, please invite friends, family, enemies, whoever you want to come. Uh, it's that's completely right. open. So. That's right. Good point. Invite all of your enemies to this presentation. <laughs> this is a new remix of Invite Your Friends. I love it, Shay. Thank you. Yes. Invite all your enemies. And uh, hopefully we'll see them and your friends next week. Oh, my gosh. Take care, everybody. Bye, everyone.